Welcome to the City Club of Eugene's April 30th, 2021 program, Seeing the Forest for the Trees, the Emerald Valley's Urban Forest. This is the 31st program for our 2020-21 programming year. My name is Kitty Piercy, and I'm the incoming president of the City Club. Support for the City Club is provided by our members and sponsors. You can become a member of City Club at our website, cityclubofeugene.org. Our programs are always available on, your, on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page and are broadcast on public radio station KLCC 89.7 on Mondays at 7. We have both business and in-kind sponsors, including our diamond sponsors, which are Kaiser Permanente, University of Oregon, Peace Health and Lane Community College, as well as generous support from the city of Eugene and from Lane County. And we appreciate it. In today's program, we discuss seeing the forest for the trees, the Emerald Valley's urban forest. Our speakers today are Scott Aldenhoff and management analysis for the city of Eugene's urban forestry program. Dr. Bart Johnson, a professor of landscape architecture at the University of Oregon. And Dr. Vivek Shandes is a professor of climate adaptation and director of the Sustaining Urban Places Research Lab at Portland State University. Biographical information on our speakers is available on our website, cityclubofeugene.org. I want to thank Karin Knudsen for coordinating today's program. Everybody knows the Emerald Valley is home to tall firs. But what is the health and status of Eugene's urban forest? The interconnected network of trees, vegetation, and open space within our urban area. What are its unique characteristics and how does it impact Eugene's sustainability, equity, and climate resilience goals? Good questions. In the 1800s, the Willamette Valley was described as a wide expanse of prairie interspersed with oak savanna and oak woodland, a rich habitat actively managed by the Kalapuyan, Kalapuyan peoples. Much of Eugene's current urban forest has been planted at this area, urbanized in neighborhoods developed over the past 150 years, though the resulting canopy is not equitably distributed. Today, Eugene's trees are essential infrastructure for city life, capturing rainwater, trapping pollution, providing habitat, and supporting our community's health and vitality through the seasons. Among their most uh, profound contributions is to mitigate urban heat island effect, the phenomenon by which unshaded, impervious, heat absorbing areas become significantly hotter and less healthy than surrounding areas, which translates directly to disparities in human health. Increasing urban forest cover is among the actions outlined in Eugene's Climate Action Plan, a goal that sits alongside objectives to encourage compact development, to reduce emissions and preserve forested areas and agricultural land beyond the urban growth boundary. This program will discuss ways in which these goals might intertwine and the profound role of the urban forest in supporting a more equitable and resilient community. Our format today includes a question and answer period with City Club members via Zoom. Hi, I'm Bart Johnson. Really delighted to be with you all today to talk about our urban forests. I've titled my segment, Not Seeing the Forest for the Trees. And to help you understand my concern that we can lose sight of the forest by paying too much attention to the trees, I'll start by building some foundational ideas. The first is that when we say urban forest, we mostly think of trees. But what else should we be thinking of? A forest is more than its trees. It includes shrubs, grasses, and wildflowers, birds, lizards, bees, and squirrels. A forest is an ecosystem comprised of many types of organisms. And much of what keeps a forest going over time and it gives it resilience, for example, to drought, heat, and climate change, is below ground and out of sight. Not only the physical soil, but all the organisms that make soil a living thing, from insects and other arthropods that are the foundations of soil food webs, to bacteria that are critical to nutrient cycling, and the mycorrhizal fungal that create interconnected networks of plants, exchanging nutrients and synthesized compounds with the fungi and other plants. 
the second idea beyond the, uh, that of that the forest is more than its trees is that we tend to have a hard time reconciling the two parts of the term urban forest in a way that seamlessly brings together its cultural and ecological components. On the one hand, when we say forest, we may think of that complex entity I described before, a diverse and interconnected set of organisms and relationships that function mostly on their own. They don't fundamentally rely on continued human input. On the other hand, when we say urban, we naturally think of people. We think of our buildings and our streets, our stores and homes and roads. We probably think of plants, but mostly in highly manicured settings where the species composition, their spatial organization, and whether they live or die depends on frequent and continued human inputs. Think of gardens, planter boxes, parks with trees and mown lawns and sprinkler irrigation systems. So what do you see in your mind's eye when I say urban forest? I can tell you what happens to me. My brain splits the scene into two images. I see the simple geometry of neatly ordered street trees with little growing underneath them. And I see natural areas like the ridgeline trail with complex messy arrangements of native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers. I see these as disparate things and not as related elements of a seamless urban forest. If we want to think about the urban forest as a whole, we have to embrace a continuum from highly managed and simplified cultural ecosystems to complex remnants of diverse native ecosystems. And to recognize that even those two extremes are both cultural and natural. Furthermore, if we want to say urban forest, when we think first and foremost of urban and secondly of forest, it's as if the urban precedes the forest and we miss sight of the fact that what precedes urban here are the prairies and savannas and woodlands that Kitty described and the myriad species that comprise those ecosystems for thousands upon thousands of years. And we also ignore that these complex native ecosystems were also cultural ecosystems managed and tended by the Kalapuya Ilihi for thousands of years and on whose ancestral lands we have now built our cities and our homes. Why is this important? It's not because I'm suggesting we should create our urban forest primarily to support native biodiversity and us versus them argument, nor to recreate the past, but rather that these long standing native species and their ecological relationships bring meaning and benefits to our city in multiple ways. First, they can provide a wide array of services that make the city a good place for people. More on that later. Second, that our urban forest can be part of a landscape fabric that supports regional ecosystems rather than simply supplants them. Finally, that incorporating elements of our historical ecosystems into our urban landscapes creates a sense of place that makes Eugene, Oregon different than Savannah, Georgia, San Francisco, Billings, Montana, or Washington, DC. When I drive through the Whitaker and I see these enormous big leaf maples with giant panicles of flowers in the spring and giant leaves as big as my head, I know I'm in the Pacific Northwest. And when I drive down my street in South Eugene, which is lined with Oregon white oaks that are remnants of an ancient savanna ecosystem, I feel myself a deeper part of this place. To, to me, it gets really interesting when I start to think of our urban forest in this way as a, as a living connector between our urbane cultural needs for shade and beauty and green things growing around us and the deep roots of species and ecosystems that have called this place home for thousands of years and that still persist in remnants and natural areas on the margins and sometimes right inside of our city. This raises the question of how we can reinstate selected, and I want to emphasize selected components and functions of these time-tested ecosystems in useful cultural forms inside our cities, thus conferring some of the benefits they're well-suited to provide, including being relatively self-sustaining and adaptive to change through their webs of relationships. They've passed the test of thousands of years of adapting this place to its changing climate, its changing fire regimes and more. And simultaneously, we can consider how to connect our urban forests functionally to the remnants of native ecosystems around our cities and sometimes inside of them. Remnants that we have identified as key targets for restoration and conservation, thus creating this seamless integration between our native forests and biodiversity and the urbane places we can call home. So I spent about 40 years trying to wrap my head around these issues. And my conclusion is that by posing these as trade-offs between urban and natural, 
in our urban forest, we create an impossibly to reconcile contradiction between urbanity and nature. And we've lost sight of the ways in which the long-standing native species and ecosystems of this place can give meaning and vitality to our own lives as urban people. To make this work in practice, I suggest that our urban forest should be considered as a continuous mosaic of different ecosystems that range from street trees to urban parks with lawns and scattered trees to residential neighborhoods where each resident has their own idiosyncratic version of what it means to make a home to our remnants and restorations of the great prairie, savanna, woodland, and forest ecosystems as a land, such as Mount Pisgah, the Ridgeline Trail System, the West Eugene Wetlands. And also that we find benefit when we bring new ways to bring some of these species and their ecosystem relationships into even the core of our urban fabric. So I propose that in each of these different settings, we can manage for both people and nature. We need to recognize that most of our Historical ecosystems had sparse a few trees, so I'd argue that even though we call it the urban forest, we need to think of prairie grasslands, savannas, woodlands, forests, again, both in very cultural forms and ecological forms. We need to recognize that through our urban forest, we're building new relationships between people and place, and should acknowledge and incorporate the benefits and the wisdom of the ecosystems and peoples who occupied this land long before European American settlement. And we also need to recognize and respond to the fact that we're surrounded by and benefit from remnants of these historical ecosystems in our parks and our wildland urban inter inter interface, just as we can benefit from bringing them and the native species into our cities. So what do we get from having functional elements and native ecosystems in and around our cities? We call these things ecosystem services, things that ecosystems provide that directly benefit people, shade and comfort on a hot day, slowing down and infiltrating water after a storm, cleansing the air by settling out dust and turning carbon dioxide into oxygen, carbon sequestration to help mitigate climate change, beauty around us that complements and contrasts with the rigid lines of streets and buildings, places for recreation adventure, and a sense of place that we're living in the Pacific Northwest and not any town USA. And if well managed, they can also bring us protection from fire risk. Now, Scotty's going to describe to you how they can also provide ecosystem disservices. Urban forests can create fire risk. Trees can fall on homes and cars. They can produce some of the pollen that makes me take Allegra every morning in the spring. But they also have many services that we're only beginning to understand. For example, we're just beginning to consider that healthy air may be more than the absence of pollutants. We see evidence that exposure to the microbes that colonize the surfaces of plants and inhabit soils may be important in helping children develop healthy immune systems by providing a gentle prodding that tests and trains their immune systems. And you know how when you walk on through the forest on a warm day and you fill up your lungs and go, you're breathing in the volatile organic compounds released by the conifers. And that rich earthy undertone, that's the smell of fungi in the soils. And it's stimulating pleasure centers in your brain because we've evolved as organisms evolve, immersed in these biochemical baths of complex ecosystem and with which our bodies and our minds and our metabolisms have co-involved. So I hope I built a little case and a preceding to set up for Scotty and Vivek to talk about different perspectives on the urban forest. I just want to close with a couple of examples too of I guess the pleasures and the meaning that come from from this. For over 20 years now, my partner and I have built a garden with native species in part of our yard. It's so rich out in front with our prairie wildfires that sometimes when I'm trying to get to work, I'm late because all I can do is stop and see the enormous numbers of native bees and native pollinators and shining insects that are coming to our yard. And yet, when I go right next door to my neighbors with their non-native species, the pollinators aren't there. Native pollinators need our native flowers. And finally, in part of our urban forest here, we sometimes need to remove a tree because it gets damaged in the storm or it's created too much shade or blocked our views. And so we create wildlife snags. We girdle the base of them. This tree slowly dies. We trim off the top branches and we leave it there to our neighbor's surprise and consternation. But because we're starting to participate in the life of the ecosystem, the life and death of it. And as that tree begins to decay, it becomes a wildlife hotel. We have black capped chickadees, red breasted nuthatches, white nuthatches, uh, downy woodpeckers and flickers all competing to create cavities in these trees for their nesting. 
It's like living in part of a uh, wildlife kingdom around us. The most stunning of which was when a pair of pileated woodpeckers, and if you know woody woodpecker, these were the models for woody woodpecker with the big red crest. They are woodpeckers with 21 inch wingspans who came and deconstructed a snag and took it from 25 foot tall down to 12 foot tall in less than two years to get the grubs underneath it, creating this amazing living sculpture. People were driving down our street with their cameras just to see this amazing piece of wildlife in our yard. And that's because we took a lesson from nature. We brought back in life and we brought back in death into there in a way that was rebirth. And I'll end with a quote from the bard William Shakespeare who said, the earth that's nature's mother is her tomb. What is her burying grave? That is her womb. And that's our little contribution here to the urban forest. Thank you. And I'll look forward to talking more with you afterward. And I'll pass it on to Scotty Altendorf. Thanks so much, Bart. Um, thank you for the reminder that we humans are part of the landscape and that the landscape is part of us. We're not something separate from it. Um, I've long thought that the true primary asset of our urban forests, um, as you mentioned, is the soil. And trees are simply an ephemeral expression of that primary asset. So that's a good reminder. Before I get too far, I'd just like to thank the entire City Club for hosting this important program and forum. The City Club program is definitely on my short list of things I love most about living in Eugene, and you're definitely building community one conversation at a time, so it's an honor to take part, especially in the company of the likes of Bart and Vivek. Also, before I go too far, I'd like to echo what Bart said, acknowledging the fact that our discussion today is occurring within the traditional homeland of the Kalapuya people. And the amazing bounty that we enjoy here in Eugene has been secured through the systematic displacement and disenfranchisement of black indigenous and people of color or BIPOC communities. I mention this not to instill guilt or make anyone feel badly, but to humbly recognize and help heal the harm that centuries of socioeconomic and racial injustice have caused. It seems clear that Recently, a window of opportunity is open to change things for the better in our society, and I believe that trees and urban nature can play an important role in the ceiling. I suspect that Vivek will likely talk more about this. Uh, my aim today will be to provide you with a brief overview of four main things. First, I'd like to share a bit about my work with the City of Eugene's urban forestry and parks and open space teams, and uh, let you know what our role is in helping to manage our city's trees. Then I'd like to share a bit about the current state of our urban forest, at least as seen from where I sit, answering the question, what do we have? Then I'll move on to uh, sharing a little bit about uh, our vision and goals for Eugene's urban forest in the future, answering the question, what do we want or need? And then lastly, I'd like to share some basic recommendations for strategies to achieve our urban forest goals, answering the question, how do we get from where we are to where we want to be. So diving right in, um, as you may have read in my bio, I work for the City of Eugene's Urban Forestry Team, which is part of the green infrastructure section in the Parks and Open Space Division. Parks and Open Space is one of several divisions within the Public Works Department. Our team is just one of many within the city organization with duties that involve managing or regulating trees. Our informal slogan is clean air, clean water, healthy people. Our team's main responsibility is the planning and management of Eugene's street tree population, that is to say, trees located in the public right of way. In contrast, trees in our parks and open space areas are managed by our parks planning and park operations teams. Although our team used to be heavily involved in the regulation of trees on private property, this is now completely undertaken by staff in our planning department, so an entirely different department. Although our authority and focus centers on street trees, which are arguably the most important and conspicuous subpopulation of the urban forest, we recognize if, that if we wanna have a great urban forest in Eugene, we really need to operate holistically and collaboratively across boundaries so that we exert um, positive influence in other areas where we can and where it's appropriate and consulting and leading by positive example. I think it's important to remember that great urban forests don't happen by accident. As Bart alluded, they're always the result of diligent planning and management. 
And this requires a lot of strategic investment involving funding, labor, and resources. That's in contrast to a natural forest, which uh, is self-perpetuating. Uh, getting back to our uh, team, our mission is to maximize the social, economic, and environmental benefits of Eugene's urban forest and to minimize its costs and liabilities by means of adaptive management and community engagement. We recognize that all trees have pros and cons, but the trick is to really focus on optimizing ecosystem services and minimizing ecosystem disservices. Examples of ecosystem services would include air quality benefits, water quality and stormwater benefits, soil conservation benefits, carbon sequestration benefits, energy conservation benefits, habitat benefits, and perhaps most importantly, the many social and human health benefits. Disservices would include tree risks and hazards, built infrastructure damage, maintenance costs, pollen production, forest fires, etc. We recognize that it's essential to stay flexible and adaptive in how we approach our work and as conditions change, uh, in how we approach our work as conditions change, and that we really have to build partnerships and coalitions if we're going to have a chance of being successful. All right, moving quickly into our current state of affairs uh, in terms of Eugene's urban forest, answering the question, what do we have? Uh, I'm going to go really fast here and just give you a broad overview. Thanks in large part to the work of VVEX team back in 2016 and 2018, we know that in the Eugene Springfield metropolitan area, we have 1.1 million trees that are taller than 35 feet. 75% uh, of these trees are on private property and 25% are on public property. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, the vast majority of our trees in our uh, region are on private property. Here in Eugene, we have about 23% canopy cover citywide, and this ranges from a low of about 3.5% in the industrial corridor to a high of approximately 62% in the southeast neighborhood um, of south, uh, south Eugene. Eugene has had 30% plus in the not so distant past, and Portland currently has uh, just under 30%, I believe is the most recent figure. So um, we're a little behind where um, we could and should be, and I'll talk about that later. Um, there are seven out of 25 neighborhood associations with an urban tree canopy cover or urban tree canopy above 30%. Eight neighborhoods uh, have urban tree canopy below 20%, and this is where we really like to focus our efforts. In terms of trends, we've noticed that uh, over the last decade, we seem to be losing on average about 1% canopy cover uh, each year. And this is significant. Um, that number definitely spiked uh, or increased uh, in terms of the tree loss after our storms in 2014 and 2016. Uh, by way of reference, I know 1% can seem very abstract. If uh, we assume that 1% of our full city area is 259 acres. That would mean that uh, each year we're losing about 32 and a half of our Haywood Field stadiums per year. That's an eight acre site. So hopefully that gives you a visual uh, reference for what we're losing. That's significant. Um, in terms of uh, the population of trees, Douglas fir definitely make up the largest percentage of our citywide tree population. And as anyone who's hiked or uh, driven through our South Hills has likely seen, climate change and extended drought uh, stress are taking their toll. So we do have a major vulnerability. Uh, likewise, we also have a fair number of Oregon ash in riparian areas and uh, wetlands. And these are currently doing well, but they're extremely acceptable to the dreaded emerald ash borer, an exotic beetle that is wreaking havoc back east and could easily wind up here if someone transports a load of infected wood. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, the important thing to note in terms of uh, tree canopy is that it is not uh, evenly distributed across the, the city. We know for a fact that our more affluent areas of town have significantly more tree canopy cover than our economically disadvantaged neighborhoods. This is due to a number of factors, but in large part, it's due to the fact that these areas were developed later and haven't had the chance to develop larger trees. Uh, and they were 
former wetlands and agricultural areas that don't have the uh, same dug fir growing capabilities. Uh, it's important to note that we also, in these areas with low tree canopy cover, have some of the worst air quality and some of the highest summertime temperatures. And I suspect VDEP will likely talk more about this. In terms of, um, I think I will move to annual benefits on an annual uh, basis, uh, based on a 2018 assessment, our jet, our urban forests, just the street tree population alone, which is 20% of our greater urban forest, generates more than $5 million in ecosystem services a year. These are aesthetic and social benefits, stormwater benefits, air quality benefits, carbon sequestration, and energy conservation benefits. This is not uh, including the number of co-benefits that are hard to quantify, but still very uh, operative or considerable. So um, in terms of when Policymakers have to ask about return on investment. Our urban forest definitely uh, provides. Uh, so, jumping quickly to our vision for the urban for uh, the urban forest, we'd like to see, um, in connection with our climate action plan that was just published last year, we've established six major goals: uh, thirty percent average canopy cover throughout Eugene within ten years. We'd like to. Uh, have better tools for measure, measuring, monitoring, and communicating the state uh, and trends of the urban forest. We are uh, hoping for a current and uh, regularly updated comprehensive plan for managing the urban forest, uh, a vision and action plan that I'm working on currently. Dedicated resources, uh, staff labor and equipment to maintain a sub 10 year pruning cycle. That's a huge component of having a quality urban forest inputs, as Bart mentioned, are essential. We also need strong alignment and collaboration among different departments and uh, among management agencies uh, in the broader community, especially involving the private sector. And lastly, we'd like to um, refine our street and uh, right-of-way design standards to ensure that soil quality and quantity is adequate to support large healthy trees. In terms of our recommended strategies for Moving forward, uh, how to get from where we are to where we want to be. We know we need to bolster cross sector and interagency partnerships to build capacity. We need to know that as a community, we need to invest heavily in information systems and new technologies that will allow us to bolster understanding and awareness, especially regarding the impacts of hardscapes and impervious surfaces relative to canopy. We need to protect and maintain existing trees wherever possible on public and private property. We need to bolster targeted and well-planned tree planting, both on public and private property. Uh, it's uh, important to note if everyone in our city took responsibility and, and for planting and establishing three to five trees per year over the next decade, we'd be able to meet our canopy goals. Uh, and lastly, we need to make sure that our efforts are serving the people who need the benefits of trees and urban nature the most. That is, we need to make sure that the Investments and priorities that we set are equitable throughout the system and address longstanding socioeconomic and racial disparities. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn things over to Professor Vivek Shandas from Portland State University. Great. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Bart. Uh, thank you, Karen. This has been really a wonderful opportunity to jump into a conversation that I spend most of my waking hours uh, thinking about. And um, just a little bit about me, because some of you may not, I may not have met many of you. Um, I tend to look at these landscapes in uh, very uh, profound and deeply affected ways because I uh, am an immigrant from a place in South India where landscapes were mangoes and bananas and guavas all around. And those were the trees I often climbed and um, got comfortable with. And some of my earliest memories are standing in, my, in the apartment building next to a series of bunion trees and watching the monkeys actually jump onto the balcony and go and often really um, um, uh, <laughs> uh, charge after my mother who was in the kitchen um, with various foods that they really were hungering for. And so 
those early experiences of seeing trees, as Bart was describing, right in my backyard, right next to me, and seeing all the wildlife, whether it be the pollinators or in this case, big vertebrates that were in and around these uh, landscapes in, and interacting with those on a consistent basis and uh, moving to uh, Northern California where I ended up just seeing um, a lot more very delineated landscapes, a lot fewer monkeys for sure, and lots more opportunity for me to kind of investigate the small ecologies, um, the microecologies of the backyard. And that's really where I cut my teeth on trying to understand landscapes in a way where I had personally experienced such a profound uh, transformation in the way people live and what that might mean in terms of what's happened in the past. And so what I want to talk a little bit of, uh, with you today about is the relationship between what we see on our landscapes today and what uh, in what ways has that been locked in from a lot of uh, decisions that were made in the past and how we have to really think about recentering engagement with disinvested communities to really enable these ecosystem services and all the wonderful uh, opportunities and cultural depth that the, that trees and um, the green spaces around us really provide. And so part of that really comes to understanding the relationship that we have on an everyday experience. Both Bart and Scott were talking a lot about their everyday experience of interacting with the trees, seeing how the services and disservices can be directly affecting communities um, right in their backyard or across an entire metro region like Eugene Springfield. And so what the everyday experiences really brings up is the fact that these trees provide shade, provide clean air, provide so many cultural uh, services and these ecosystem services. And the question we've been really asking is, why do we see some sidewalks with a number of tr large trees? And why do we have some areas and sidewalks that have very few trees? What, it helps to explain this distribution of the existing green spaces in and around cities. And, and Eugene is a great example of this. Um, as we think about what, as you think about what might be places that you've been that have a lot of trees and those that might have little. I wonder if you've thought about why that might be the case. And that's where we really want to spend some time thinking about what's gone on in history, what's gone on in the past to really reveal some of the patterns we've been seeing. We've been spending a lot of time thinking about climate change in relation to this question of trees um, in our lab. And one of the things that's really coming up is um, the relationship between the hotter temperatures that we're experiencing in the Pacific Northwest, the ability of trees to really cope with that, and of course the public health impacts that those hotter temperatures bring. And if trees are a fundamental and um, important frontline defense to hotter summers and polluted air, then what might be the um, result of planning practices that might have prioritized tree plantings in the past in some areas and not in others. And so that got us really thinking about this question of heat. And in a study that we published last year, we looked at about 108 cities across the country and examined the relationship between where was it the hottest in these cities, these urban heat islands as they're referred to, where the temperature not only in the city is hotter than the countryside or adjacent forest lands, though also within neighborhood or at the street level, how much hotter are these areas than their um, surrounding areas? And when we looked at this closely, we were finding that temperatures varied often by about 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit in and around cities across the United States, including Eugene. And, and we were asking the question, so why is it that there are um, some areas that are often wealthier areas, often leafier areas, often wider areas that tended, racially wider areas that tended to have much cooler temperatures and those that were um, uh, lower income and often um, communities of color having hotter temperatures. And I'd posed this question over the last few years to my colleagues and they kept coming back to me saying, you know, that's the luxury effect. That's the idea that we have a history of people who have more wealth and they're able to maintain the trees, they're able to get them pruned, they're able to plant trees, they're able to really steward the local landscape in a way that allows for these communities to have these leafier uh, neighborhoods. And that felt deeply unsatisfying, unsatisfying to me. And it was 
um, really then that I started digging into what were some of the systems in place that might have um, created these disparities in the tree cover and the temperature in and around neighborhoods across the US. And so we started looking at the history of a particular policy that was passed in 1930s called redlining, which is essentially, for those of you who aren't familiar with redlining, it divided cities across the country. And this was a federal agency called the Homeowners Loan Corporation that divided cities into four types of neighborhoods. One was considered, quote, the best neighborhood. And this was best because mortgages and services could go into these uh, neighborhoods, and it was very favorable for banks to be able to give loans to uh, potential property owners in this neighborhood. And the, that was graded A, as an A in a class would be a very good grade. B neighborhoods were also uh, still desirable, as it was termed, and those were uh, neighborhoods that were often allowed to be uh, mortgaged and allowed for uh, services such as parks and green spaces to be um, established. And then we had C neighborhoods, which were considered definitely declining, and neighborhoods that often had larger populations, low income populations, uh, immigrant populations at the time, as well as uh, communities of color. And then there was the D uh, graded neighborhoods that were considered, quote, hazardous, um, which were predominantly communities of color and, um, and uh, lower income communities. And so Part of what that ended up creating in the 1930s as our study was beginning to reveal is that that particular policy that was then uh, uh, abolished in, uh, during the civil rights uh, acts of the 19, late 1960s, the Fair Housing Act, Act removed that. And in Oregon, it was removed actually about a decade earlier, um, any discriminatory practices. Nevertheless, what we were still seeing in cities today was much hotter temperatures and much leafier neighborhoods in those that were A and B neighborhoods as opposed to the C and D counterparts. And so that was an aha moment for us as we started seeing that on average, a D grade neighborhood has about 40% or higher um, impervious surface. That's the concrete, asphalt, as opposed to only less than about 20% tree canopy. So when you hear Scott, someone who works for the city, talking about 30% on average, what we're really talking about is trying to bring those D and C grade neighborhoods up higher in terms of the amount of canopy and centering those neighborhoods as potential planting locations, though I'll come back to that in a minute. And this pattern held out regardless of whether we looked at nationally, in the Midwest, Northeast, Northwest, South, or West. This was a pattern that really held out in all the cities we were studying. And if you think about this for a moment, if a federal policy um, require, require, uh, reduces the likelihood of, of um, investment into certain neighborhoods, as, as we're thinking about roads and industrial facilities and a number of other land uses that bring with it a great deal of asphalt and impervious surface, all through the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, these were the areas that were identified as where the road, massive infrastructure projects would go, like the Federal Highway Administration putting roads in. It was consistently in C and D areas. And so getting trees into those areas or parks into those areas were already prohibitive in part because they were locked in with the landscape and tearing up a freeway or tearing up a large scale industrial complex is very uh, cost prohibitive. And so what we have is this legacy uh, of massive amounts of concrete and asphalt that were laid in specific parts of Eugene that now make it very difficult for Scott and his crew to be able to get in there and get the trees in the ground. And so what we're really contending with is a, a past practice that we really have to reconcile with and come to terms with in terms of being able to create an equitable urban forest for everybody to um, enjoy those ecosystem services that we were talking about earlier. I want to just kind of wrap up with a couple of more, um, more contemporary concepts that are also affecting the urban forest that Bart and Scott were referring to. And what we are finding in some recent studies with colleagues at Reed uh, College here in Portland is the relationship between temperature and survivability of a certain species of trees that we refer to as native species here. What we're finding, and we're just looking at this um, with Douglas fir, western red cedar, and big leaf maple, uh, three of uh, three species that were just described a little bit earlier, we're looking at the 
how difficult is it for these trees to move water up the column? So this is a very simple measure that you can do and looking at, it's essentially called the loss in conductivity across the, um, the stem of the tree. And we're finding that those trees in hotter environments, so same tree, 80 plus year old tree, um, Douglas fir or big leaf maple or Western red cedar in a hot part of a city, whereas faring far worse and far more vulnerable than one that was in a cooler part of the city. Same species. And what that's starting to suggest to us is we're starting to see a great deal of Western red cedar die, die back in, in the Pacific Northwest. And we're starting to um, hypothesize that this may be the result of a shifting climate and that these native species are really struggling with some of these hotter temperatures that we're enduring in and around our urban environments. And so that's one additional challenge. Another challenge that was referred to by Scott as well in terms of the loss of tree canopy over time and the acres um, or hectares of, of tree for, of forest that are being lost is this idea of how specific neighborhoods, in this case, those C and D neighborhoods that we referred to, that I referred to earlier, are the places where the largest population growth is happening. When you look at the neighborhoods that were delineated A, B, C, and D in the 1930s, the C and D neighborhoods, meaning the definitely declining and the hazardous titled neighborhoods, are those places that are seeing the greatest population growth and therefore in infrastructure development, which then translates to a green squeeze, a pushing out of the trees, lot, so lot edge to lot edge development, where there's very little opportunity for trees and green spaces to exist. And if Scott is telling us that the vast majority of green spaces exist in private property, then what does it mean when we have large scale lot, lot edge to lot edge developments occurring in and around Eugene um, today? And so that's yet another challenge that we're um, encountering. What we're trying to do as a result, and as I wrap up here, um, is trying to engage communities in ways that could really reckon, recognize the, enorm the enormity of the challenge of getting green spaces into urbanized environments. You'd think it'd be just as easy as digging a hole and putting a tree in it, but you can imagine the complexity and the number of different factors, not only historic, though also contemporary, that are challenging us to be able to get a simple tree into the ground. And so what I wanna kind of come around with is just three closing provocations for you to think about and, um, and stew on over, over um, as we think about what the future might hold for how we protect our public health through the ecosystem services, how we really um, move forward given all of these challenges. I wanna start with the provocation that the same systems that created these inequities have not changed since the inception of redlining policies. We are in an institutional setting that has many historic, um, historic dimensions that would really prevent folks like Scott from being able to move forward on centering uh, trees in historically disinvested areas. So that, that poses a really big challenge for us. The second provocation I wanna um, leave you with is that simply moving trees into disinvested neighborhoods can further amplify existing inequities. There's been a great deal of distrust that communities have um, create, that, that uh, has been harboring in terms of uh, relationships to uh, um, city governments, municipal governments, et cetera, over longstanding um, uh, policies that have really disenfranchised and historically alienated several um, marginalized communities. And so moving trees into a neighborhood without engagement, without act active trust building first, and recognizing that there might be a lot of economic insecurities, not to mention putting a tree into the ground, it might lead to a challenge in survivorship, not only because of the heat, but because somebody may not want it and just take it down. Um, that uh, really requires us to create a, uh, th the third provocation, a community-based neighborhood scale engagement campaign that allows us to really think about governance processes in relation to tree planting processes and the ability to share power in terms of management of these uh, landscapes. And so with that, I wanna close, not with a Shakespeare quote, but with a Grammy award-winning um, uh, uh, urban forester named Janet Jackson, who said, what has nature done for me lately? And with that, I'll just turn it over to you and, uh, and my little piece here. Thank you very much for 
your um, attention and inviting me to participate in this really important conversation. Thank you to all of our speakers today. Now we're going to begin City Club's moderated Q&A that finishes every City Club of Eugene program. And our first question today is from City Club President-elect Kitty Piercy. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, very stimulating. I really appreciated the conversation today and just want to tell you, it just made me think of so many things. I'm going to have a hard time controlling how, how much I try to ask you at the same time. But I did want to say, and you kind of hinted at it, whoever wants to answer this, I think home ownership has something to do with canopy. Rental property and to a large extent, people don't invest as much in their personal care for their um, rental property as they do for property they own. So that that has that redlining effect too in a lot of ways, I think. And if you want to make any comments on that. And then the other thing I think about is uh, we have lost um, how people feel about taking care of the trees that planted in front of their houses. They mostly think it's the city's responsibility and they just kind of don't pay any attention to it. That kind of thing you were talking about community uh, working together I think is so important in getting people to reframe how they feel about the trees that we try to put in our neighborhoods, but they, don't, they don't, are not necessarily cared for in the way they need to be cared for. And the, uh, my final thing, um, uh, and you can pick any of these you want, is I, I also worry about what impact in our work on infill will have on the capacity for, for canopy growth as we, move away from larger yards and larger uh, open space uh, in, in the way we're trying to deal with keeping people in closer. I, I don't know if we're really thinking about that kind of ecosystem look at what we're really doing. Uh, and I, I, I just like to hear any, any of that I said that any of you want to respond to, I'd appreciate. Dr. Shandis, could you speak a little bit to that observation about uh, home ownership and investment in trees and neighborhoods? And then Scott, maybe some about uh, that interface between care and stewardship of urban tree canopy and what we can do to support that with infill development. Sure. Um, one of the things I might just note about renting versus owning, I couldn't agree more is that there is a sense of self-efficacy when one is owning a property and you're able and you're really almost expected to, in many cases, take care of it. In some homeowners association, you see that really expressed very clearly where uh, there are certain kinds of landscape management practices that are required by uh, households. Uh, on the other end, when you think about renters, it's not necessarily that we found in our survey work that renters don't want trees. It's that they don't know, uh, they, they don't have the agency to be able to plant them. And they're often told by the property manager or the owner of the property that they're not allowed to do that. Right. And so it, it's really a uh, challenge in terms of wanting something in your property, but yet not being able to do it. And of course, with multifamily residential, the designs that we have, I will just note, really prohibit our ability to get um, trees in the ground because often what you would see is a two to three story horseshoe shaped design with a big parking lot in the middle and really limited space around. And we've been working with a few cities to show the opportunities that might lend itself with multifamily residential, with higher density, that it really comes down to a design question more than it's higher density, therefore no trees. And we really want to work with the private industry and private develop developers specifically to find design options that I know folks like BART and other landscape architects have been working on for a very long time to be able to um, splice in green spaces in higher density developments. And Scott, a few thoughts about that interface with uh, between, you know, uh, what is owned as private property and trees that live in the public realm. Yes, uh, that's an excellent question, Kitty. Thanks for asking. I my mind immediately went to our new um, development on South Willamette Street. That's an area with intense competition for space where we have uh, so many competing interests and so little room for trees. Um, I know uh, I'm not happy with the number of trees that will end up in the right of way there, but um, I take inspiration from the fact at the intersection of 25th and Willamette, 
on the west side of the street, it's somewhat ironic to me that a new development, a strip mall, as they're affectionately referred to, has some amazing landscaping that actually uh, has more than a, uh, 10 trees and is really quite attractive and provides an immense uh, number of ecosystem services. So when it comes to partnerships, public and private, I think it's important, as you mentioned, to not assume that the city is going to do it all. It, it takes that active uh, partnership between private property owners or renters uh, and community members and government, but also nonprofit and uh, the commercial sector. It's when we're all doing a little bit that it makes a difference. But uh, find, in closing, the, the tension that we're experiencing currently um, resulting from our state urban growth boundaries, we're kind of at the uncomfortable state. Uh, those conflicts are coming to a head. I like to think that uh, we'll have a period of 20 to 30 years of uh, extreme discomfort and tension, but then we'll finally figure it out. So I'm hopeful, but I can tell you as an urban forester trying to get trees in the ground, it's a challenge. And I know my colleagues in planning are facing that same thing. Thank you. So just 20 or 30 years of extreme discomfort, Scott, that's what we can take away. Um, but I'll hopefully find uh, some motivation to work together uh, on these issues. Our second question is from City Club Program uh, Committee member Mary Layton. So, so I hear you talking about the desirability of trees and I think about last summer, the people in Woodleaf Terrace and the people like me at near 40th and Willamette were both probably worrying about trees. I love Woodleaf Terrace because it is a very nicely forested low income housing development, but I, I look at my house with great suspicion and think how many of these trees have to go in order for me not to, to be burned up the next time. So how do you, rec I mean, what should I be worried about? How can we handle that? Scott, if you would offer some thoughts about the urban wild interface and, and fire, certainly a lot to be thinking about in the context of this past year. You bet. I uh, saw Bart raise his hand. Do you have a contribution, Bart? Or Maybe I'll just jump in with that. Sure, Scott, and try to leave room for you. I'll be as brief as I can about an issue that warrants a lot more time and conversation. As I work extensively with wildfire, and we've been simulating and modeling wildfire under climate change in the wild and urban interface, and it is obviously an extreme danger that we have not come to grips with yet. At the same time, within our city areas, you have to have fuels that allow a fire to lead up to your area or it has to arrive the members and spot in. And particularly around our borders, we're dense downtown and there's just not many fuels around you. The likelihood that you will have a problem in an isolated urban neighborhood are very, very low under current conditions. I say that with extreme caution. But I do think we have to particularly pay attention to the things that can lead fire into the urban area. And that's our wild and urban interface. That's the South Hills. That's places where our urban landscapes are abutting larger areas of wild and fuels. Those are what were going to protect us and might not have protected us had that fire from the Mackenzie, the Holiday Farm fire, continued to push, for instance, into the edges of Springfield. So I think there are firewise techniques that people can follow. And my guess is that actually, if you looked at that neighborhood you live, you probably would meet all the firewise standards for people who are living in a rural area by the sort of space between trees, the types of fuels we have underneath them. I think people in some cases, out of un not understanding how fire moves, have perhaps within urban areas here, been more concerned about a fire directly in their home. They need to be concerned about the fires around. Scott, as we're talking about fires, it strikes me that, you know, that is a, a topic or an area that uh, has, you know, really wide implications relative to the health of natural systems and um, things like urban forests. Could you talk a little bit about how the city um, uses fire um, or is thinking about fire as a, as a management component for, the, for maintaining the health of our forests and addressing some of those fuels that Bart mentioned? Absolutely. As Bart mentioned in his opening uh, statement, our uh, local ecology is fire dependent. The health and well-being of our soils and our, our ecosystems depend on uh, frequent low-intensity fires. So 
the city of Eugene and its community partners, the Rivers to Ridges partnership, has been using controlled burning to um, help with uh, restoration of uh, several wet prairies in West Eugene. And they're very cautious uh, about the days that they do it and how they do it and making sure that uh, the, the city isn't inundated with smoke because that, that can be have serious health and safety implications and be a, a real nuisance. But uh, when done properly, uh, it can be a great thing. They're exploring the possibility of doing that in selected ridgeline areas, but they recognize that that's uh, extremely complicated. Um, but we know from uh, a landscape restoration perspective, it is quite valuable. We're surrounded by hills here and our air quality is already, uh, whether it's pollen or other um, particulate matter, uh, diesel particulates, we're, we're challenged. Uh, but um, the ideal would be to use fire in a controlled and limited manner to, to aid natural processes. And maybe Karen, if I can take just 10 more seconds there, I think that what Scott mm -hmm. is saying too is that restoring our fire adapted historical ecosystems on the margins of town, the savannas, the woodlands, the things that aren't dense conifer forest are really critical to keeping the fire from coming in and that the use of prescribed fire to reduce the fuels and the ground layer in those places is one of the ways we protect our citizens inside from having fire come inside the city limits. It's a great point and also a wonderful point to end today's program on. We are unfortunately out of time, but I want to thank our speakers today, Scott Altenhoff from the City of Eugene, Dr. Bart Johnson from the University of Oregon's Landscape Architecture Program, and Dr. Vivek Shandas from Portland State University for helping us to see this broader landscape that our beautiful trees fit into and think a little bit more about all of the different scales of connection that we can make to better support uh, its health and the total health of that community. So thank you very much and we will see you next week. This has been our April 30th, 2021 program. Seeing the forest for the trees, the Emerald Valley's urban forest. Before we proceed, I'd like to recognize our diamond sponsors. Kaiser Permanente exists to provide high quality affordable health care services and to improve the health of our, our members and the communities we serve. More information at www.kp.org. Support comes from the University of Oregon. Since 1876, the University of Oregon has helped Oregonians question critically, think logically, reason effectively, communicate clearly, act creatively, and live ethically. More information at uoregon.edu. Peace Health is proud to serve Eugene, Lane County, and beyond. As your hometown healthcare partner for more than 80 years, their mission is to keep you and your family healthy. Learn more at peacehealth.org. Lane Community College transforms lives through learning. LCC provides comprehensive, accessible, high quality educational opportunities that pr promote student success. For more information, visit lanec.edu. I would also like to acknowledge our gold sponsors, Sacred Earth Botanicals, Emergency Veterinary Hospital, and Network Charter School. Before we thank our speakers today, I have a few quick announcements. Thanks, thank you to our in-kind sponsors. That would be KRVM 91.9 Radio, Pacin, sorry, Pack Info, and Simplified Computing LLC, Dot Dotson's Photography. And a special thank you to public radio station KLCC FM 89.7 for airing City Club's programs on Mondays at 7 p.m. Our programs are always available on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. If you are a City Club of Eugene member, you can ask a question at a future taping of our programs. And we encourage you to do that. If you are not a member, you can join and then participate. More information is on our website cityclubofeugene.org. On our program next week, City Club will speak to local writers in our program. So you want to be an author. J.C. Geiger, Leanne Jashua, Ruby McConnell, Andre Royal, and Bob Welsh will join us. Sounds great. 
More details and information about future programs can be found online at the City Club's website, cityclubofeugene.org. Now I want to thank today's speakers for a great program. Scott Aldenhoff, Bart Johnson, PhD, and Dr. Vivek Shandas. This concludes today's program. And as always, we're glad you were here. Be well and be safe.